So it's good to be with you. So as Bill said, um, I arrived in DC uh, to take over as executive director of our uh, CNS center there uh, 18 months ago. Um, and uh, this is the first time I've been able to travel uh, since then, which is a great shame. Um, but actually, it's, it, this trip is timely for me because this book is coming out. And, and this book um, is sort of the culmination of um, quite a lot of work uh, that I've undertaken. Um, sort of since I left government, and I'll talk about that uh, in a second. Um, but actually, it's also, for me, sort of the culmination of transitioning from a very technical person. You know, my first job after school was building submarines uh, to the kind of more policy-esque world. Um, so there's there's kind of a lot here. I'm going to set up as a bit like a, a book talk, so I'll, I'll summarize the main arguments of my book and so on. Uh, but let me just kind of uh, share a bit about why this book. So when I was in government, um, I was responsible for the implementation of non-proliferation controls. And what I mean by that was, um, it was sort of my job to be um, uh, looking at uh, uh, live cases of, say, uh, Iranian proliferation networks, and to try to go after them, to stop them from taking specific goods. Um, as well as, you know, lots of other things, the sanctions, the export controls, all that type of stuff. It was a really interesting job, um, but it was also a bit of a frustrating job. Why? Well, because you're chasing your tail. There's always a new proliferation network. There's always a new actor trying to buy the goods. Um, it's like, it's important to stop the specific transactions. But when you stand back and think about it, how rigorous is a regime if it's possible simply to um, create a new proliferation network and evade the controls? So the question that arose in, in my mind and other, other minds is, why do we have a regime that's um, so fragile or incomplete or set up the way it is such that we don't have more effective controls? And uh, frankly, we didn't know the answer to that. Um, partly because when you're in government, and especially a job like mine, you're very driven by the caseload that's coming through each day. You don't have a chance to stand back and reflect. There's also more systematic challenges, um, and this didn't so much apply to my team, but our foreign office counterparts had this um, post rotation policy where they'd move every two years. And that's challenging because if you start doing a job for two years, the first year you'll be learning, second year you'll be doing, and then you move on to the next thing. And that sort of means that there's not the institutional memory that would be required to build on what's gone before. And there are certain uh, remedies and, and, and so on for that, but there was nonetheless this fundamental challenge. And the challenge in my mind was we didn't know, I certainly didn't know, why the non proliferation regime had evolved as it had, such that we were sort of chasing our tails. So that was like um, my time in government. I was fortunate that I was asked to lead this program at King's. I was actually loaned from government to King's to start that program. Um, and the idea behind it was to sort of build bridges on non-proliferation between government and the private sector. But uh, when I was there, I was also asked if I'd like to do a PhD, which I did. Um, and the PhD that I wanted to use to answer that question that I just set out, why is it the regime is set up such that it is, uh, that it's not particularly effective, um, and so on. And that's uh, basically where the book comes from. I'll come back to, to, to this towards the end, uh, but I should perhaps say a word about the, the approach I took for the book. Um, so I was very fortunate that I had uh, quite a lot of resources when I was at King's, and I was able to use those to visit um, every relevant archive that I could think of. Uh, so the US, UK, Canadian National Archives, uh, plus all of the presidential libraries uh, covering the relevant period. And I collected a lot of material, and. I'll come back to this at the end, but all of those materials, um, and this is why I'm excited the book is finished, will be made available via an online um, repository, um, which are digitized and searchable, and can be used for other projects. So that was nice, a nice side of this project, um, and that kind of provided the, uh, the kind of the research base uh, for, the, for, the, um, for the questions I wanted to address. Um, so what is my argument here? The, the argument of the book is that there's a non-proliferation collective action problem. And I'll say a bit about what I mean by a collective action problem. But in my mind, it comes about because the regime itself was flawed in design. And I sort of, I traced it back, and I was also interested in questions like, 
uh, where does the uh, inalienable right that's built into the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, where does it come from? You know, it's in the NPT, but like, what was its origins? So I, I traced all this back, and I'll talk to us all this, uh, to the beginning of the nuclear age, and more specifically to the uh, Atoms for Peace initiative. And actually, that's why, um, as my slight background, I've chosen a stamp from Atoms for Peace. Um, and Atoms for Peace, of course, is the, the motto of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, and I wanted to call this book something different. I wanted to call it Atoms, comma, Somethings for Peace. Uh, but the publisher wouldn't let me away with it, so. Um, so, so um, first argument is that the regime is flawed, and I'll talk about uh, why. Um, but fundamentally, I'm going to argue that um, absent an effective system of control, and that phrase is something that I'll come back to, this collective action problem emerged, in which we have a strange situation in which it's left for each state to moderate their own action, and they're competing against each other. And yes, we have that kind of an iterative iterative development of controls, but absent a kind of an overarching system of control, uh, this collective action problem results in uh, competition and uh, insufficient implementation of controls. Now, as I go through the, uh, the, um, the, the presentation, and actually as the book is structured, um, I will also recognize that uh, the, the US and the Soviet Union um, eventually recognized that non-proliferation was in a mutual interest, and they were able to cooperate on that topic. And indeed, I know that uh, Bill uh, has a, an excellent book on uh, doomed to cooperate and uh, 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 so on, and, and the work that Bill has done uh, to demonstrate the, kind of the, uh, the need for uh, cooperation. Um, but actually, what I, I, I would argue is that in the absence of a broader system of control, the cooperation between the superpowers wasn't enough because more suppliers had come onto the scene. Those suppliers had vested interest. Uh, there was mistrust amongst suppliers, and there was a lack of progress on disarmament. And the tension between non-proliferation and disarmament is one that I'll come back to uh, talk about. Um, and because of this, uh, the, uh, the, the, the evolution of controls was hindered, um, and opportunities to improve controls uh, was lost. Um, and then, Standing back a little bit more, I kind of, uh, I explore why it was that the UN Security Council was able to start uh, acting on non-proliferation measures um, uh, after the uh, end of the Cold War, um, and in particular in the 2000s. And I think it's an important development uh, which helps to sort of complete the non-proliferation regime, and I can talk more about that. Uh, but from a collective action problem, one of the ways that you overcome a collective action problem is through and external regulation. And in my mind, the Security Council action is sort of an example of that. Um, so that's, uh, that's the kind of the, the, the overall um, argument. Um, but fundamentally, what I'm saying is that conceptualizing non-proliferation as a collective action problem provides insights into how we can counter proliferation in the future. And it's outside of the scope of the presentation today, but if I was talking about, say, missile proliferation, um, I would argue that thinking about it in these terms uh, leads to uh, some specific opportunities to improve controls. Um, because right now, for example, my sense is that it would be in the interest of the US and China to cooperate on missile non-proliferation, um, but that's not really happening. So uh, there are, I think, real world um, applications and benefits of thinking about it in this way uh, that we can talk more about. Um, before I kind of dive into uh, the, uh, the um, uh, kind of structured argument, let me just say, for anyone that's not done archival research, it's great. You find all sorts of uh, interesting, funny, quirky nuggets of information. Um, and uh, I've got a few examples uh, here that I'll kind of speak to. So one is, uh, you know, President Eisenhower stands up and uh, delivers his answer peace speech. And then the Russian Foreign Minister turns to Secretary of State Dallas and says, are you crazy? <laughs> you know, you just announced that you're going to spread highly enriched uranium around the world. Um, how are you going to control it? And then Dulles turns to his aide and says, is this true? And it sort of speaks to the fact that the, the initiative wasn't perfectly thought through, uh, wasn't uh, uh, developed. Um, but actually, this specific nugget does, doesn't come from archive materials. It comes from um, a kind of a, a self-biography. Uh, but, but it speaks to, like, there's a specific insight from this 
uh, that isn't kind of generally known in the non-proliferation community. And so it speaks to, from archive research, there's this, these little nuggets that uh, one can uh, pick up. It's a lot of fun. Um, the second uh, one relates to the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency statute negotiations, uh, where uh, the US, UK, and Canada had agreed their position before the meeting. Um, but then uh, the statute negotiations proved to be uh, difficult. Um, and the, U the UK at least thought the US was uh, going beyond the minimum agreed position. So you get this great quote of uh, the UK was uh, left to perform their ungrateful uh, task of holding the Americans in check, uh, which the, the UK delegation reports back to their uh, minister in London, uh, which is another, another little interesting uh, nugget. And then finally, um, uh, this one relates to Iran. Um, and this isn't something I had appreciated uh, but of course, we know that when the Islamic Republic uh, um, kind of started, got going, um, they were um, sort of uh, not supportive of nuclear to start with. And then there's this great uh, um, message from uh, the uh, uh, British interest section in, in, in an embassy back to London saying, yes, Iran did look like it was going to abandon nuclear. Um, but actually, they've got all these contracts that they can't die of. We're effectively making them take the uh, the, the, the material and the fuel and so on and so on. Um, so it's just not in their financial interest not to go forward with this stuff. And it's sort of counterintuitive, uh, but it's kind of a really interesting little nugget. And there are literally thousands of these kind of little funny um, anecdotes that um, come out of this uh, research. Uh, so with my plan now that the book is published is to kind of write each of these up and kind of share it with the, the, the archive documents to kind of speak to it. Cause you know, it, it's, 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 it's fun, but it's also valuable in nuclear history to know uh, this type of, uh, type of stuff. Um, let me uh, dive into the, uh, the, the, the substance of the, uh, the, the argument now. Uh, so the way that the book is set up is around uh, chapters, where a chapter is effectively a case study. Uh, there's one on uh, post-war controls, there's one on atoms for peace, and so on through the, uh, the, the nuclear age. And in each, I look at the evolution of controls over time um, and why um, better controls were not agreed. And pretty much in every period, I kind of I make the case that better controls were envisioned, uh, but were not um, reached or were not um, enacted. And the question is why? Um, the post-war period is slightly different because it's the only period in which really no international controls were agreed. Um, although um, they were negotiated. Uh, so in the book, I put this one a little bit different from the ones that follow. Uh, but actually, it's still a, a really relevant one. And when we think about, say, uh, nuclear disarmament today, and the treaty, tre treaty and the proclamation of nuclear weapons, there's real lessons from what was discussed in the 40s uh, for today. So let's just step back a second and say, so after, um, after the uh, uh, bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the US cabinet met to discuss the future of atomic energy. And uh, I've got the cabinet minutes. I, mean, I have archival documents for everything I'm going to say. Uh, but the, the archive, uh, the, the minutes of these cabinet meetings are, are really pretty interesting. Uh, you have some cabinet members who are arguing simply to give, I don't know what this means, but to give the secret of atomic energy to the Russians uh, because they didn't think that they'd be able to keep it themselves. Uh, but as on the other hand, others saying, well, you know, the Russians will take them a decade to kind of catch up, whatever it is. So there's a genuine debate uh, in the US cabinet about how to manage atomic energy. The, the, the path that was taken uh, was to uh, issue a, a joint statement. Um, and the joint statement is sort of interesting because it's, I would sort of describe it as the first articulation of the, uh, what would become the, the three pillars of the NPT and the inalienable right and so on. Uh, so when I said earlier I was interested in where that came from, I would sort of say partly this, through Atoms for Peace, uh, to the NPT, uh, but, but it's relevant. And the outcome of that was uh, to create um, an International Atomic Energy Commission. Um, and the mandate of that is shown on the right-hand side here, uh, on the graphic. Uh, but the mandate is sort of interesting. Um, it's effectively an international organization that would uh, take control of atomic energy facilities, um, in every country we would include inspection um, and other tools to uh, make sure that states were complying um, and would include measures to 
um, eliminate nuclear weapons. Uh, so in the 1940s, the thinking was that to get rid of nuclear weapons, what you need is an international organization that would own the entire nuclear fuel cycle of every country, and uh, would include inspections and so on and so on. So, you know, I think now that when we think about what disarmament might actually look like in the future, I would sort of um, revisit some of this stuff. That said, um, the 1940s uh, discussions didn't actually come to anything. They were overtaken by the Cold War. Um, you know, Russia gets the bomb, uh, and then the U.S. had this. Um, I'm going to say this wrong. My apologies uh, to, to to my American colleagues, but uh, uh, the McMahon Act. And I'm going to correct you on how to say it. Um, which basically said that America couldn't share atomic energy with anyone else, um, including, by the way, the wartime allies like the UK and so on, which really annoyed the UK, and that's something I won't touch on today, but uh, the history there is, is quite interesting. So in the 40s, you had this, uh, this effort to have an overarching system of control, didn't come to anything, and you then get stuck with the status quo of, um, you know, no international nuclear cooperation on atomic energy, uh, because most of it was held in the U.S. and forbidden by this uh, by this act. Um, I will jump on to uh, answer for peace. Uh, ignore the text at the bottom for a second. I'll speak to that. Uh, it's supposed to build, but we'll come back to that in a second. Um, so the answer for peace speech sort of kicks off international nuclear cooperation um, in in the broad sense. And actually, if you were to look at it today, I would trace. Answers for Peace is the kind of the, the beginning, beginning of the, the nuclear age as we think about it in terms of peaceful use, uses of, of nuclear energy and so on and so on. But what's interesting about it, and uh, this is history I didn't know, was that Eisenhower um, intended to make a speech uh, on the need for, and this is what it was called, candor uh, with the American uh, public to uh, basically justify increased militarization and defense spending in the context of the Cold War. And when you go back and read the archive materials from the speech, they basically they're they're drafting speeches on um, you know defense spending in the atomic age and so on, um, and they sort of ground to a halt, and they ground to a halt because it was so bleak. You know they're saying we need to build up so much, uh, uh, so, so they ground to a halt until Eisenhower was invited to address the uh, UN General Assembly. Um, you know so they kind of dusted off the speech and he's like. Well, this is fine, but I want an optimistic note. Uh, so what I deduced from the archives is that um, the idea of the atomic pool, which effectively becomes the International Atomic Energy Agency, um, was inserted pretty late in the day without any interagency vetting um, and uh, was, uh, was then presented to the UN as a propaganda tool. This is where my earlier quote about the uh, Soviet foreign minister being concerned about the speech came in. Uh, so the Soviet foreign minister says, are you crazy? You've just given this speech where you say you're going to give uh, highly enriched uranium to lots of countries worldwide. Um, and the, the US agreed that we should perhaps uh, uh, study it. Um, and also, uh, this is now perhaps where I can speak to the text at the bottom. Um, even uh, Churchill <laughs> asked Eisenhower if this might be a bad idea. And Eisenhower's like, yeah, we should probably look at that. Uh, so it sort of speaks to sort of bad uh, governmental decision making in my mind. Um, but then we come on to a, a, a more important point a year later. So it's one thing to give the speech, um, but then the question is, do you follow through on it? Um, so a year after uh, the speech, uh, there was a, uh, I think it was a cabinet meeting, or it was certainly kind of key members of the cabinet, uh, where they discussed whether or not to move forward with the initiative. Uh, and basically, there was concern that a year had passed and they hadn't done anything. Um, and partly, there was also concern from what Eisenhower called the technical folks, uh, which I, I take to mean you know, non-proliferation considerations. Um, but the point was, um, Eisenhower had to decide whether to kind of quietly let this die or to actually try to move forward with it. Um, and his concern was that if the U.S. didn't move forward and the Soviet Union did, then the U.S. effectively would have given the Soviet Union um, a, a pretty big victory in the context of the Cold War, uh, because the Soviet Union could be engaging in um, a, a trade and a cooperation uh, with lots of countries worldwide. Uh, so knowing that there were concerns from the technical folks, Eisenhower said, okay, fine, let's move forward. And that, at, in my mind, this is sort of a key pivotal uh, moment. 
Um, and to take that out of the abstract uh, slightly, uh, we can sort of talk about a real world case. Um, and this is where archival research is useful uh, uh, too, uh, because I was very focused on uh, text based archive information. Um, but when I was at the uh, Canadian uh, archives, I sort of dipped into the special collections, which is uh, imagery and multimedia and so on. And I found this. And you know, the question I was exploring was, why did Canada give India a reactor without any safeguards? And how involved was Canada? And to, to me, this image is, so the, the caption that goes with this image is, Canadian engineer uh, directs um, construction of uh, the Suresh reactor in India. But you can see that you know, this is really hands-on construction. The Canadian is literally saying, put the concrete there, uh, you know, pour it there, uh, build it there. Um, it's much more hands-on than I would have anticipated uh, just from reading the kind of the uh, the, the kind of text-based information on, on the construction. Um, so effectively, Canada took a quick decision uh, to supply this reactor to India. Um, I, I did dig into the question of why Canada did this, and I can talk to it if people are interested. Uh, but effectively, there were no safeguards associated with this reactor. Um, it was a reactor design that was you know, designed for um, uh, supporting a Manhattan uh, uh, project, uh, high neutron flux, uh, very suited to plutonium production and other things. Uh, you know, so not the type of technology you want to be giving away, and especially not without safeguards. Uh, but because Canada was moving quickly, well, uh, uh, there we go. Um, in, the, in, the, in the end, uh, India couldn't make the fuel for the first reactor load, and so that specific fuel batch had safeguards with it, uh, but the reactor itself didn't. Um, and also, uh, as a kind of another quirk of history, um, the US had supplied uh, heavy water for use in the reactor, and then after the, uh, the Indian test, uh, the US had to kind of uh, quietly admit that it had had uh, its own heavy water in this reactor. And there, were, there was like a discussion about how much of it had been lost through leaks and boiled off and so on and so on. Um, but there's a great memo that I've got that effectively says, uh, yes, there was US uh, supplied heavy water in the reactor that used was used to produce the plutonium for the Indian test. Um, I'll come back to India in a second, and I'll come back to Pakistan in a second, because there's a kind of a sequence uh, for a second. Um, but, but let me kind of jump ship slightly to talk about the uh, non-proliferation treaty in three pillars. Um, and this is where two things are happening in parallel. So you've got cooperation under arms for peace. Um, some cooperation with some countries like India, which would eventually stay outside of the NPT. And then you've got NPT-based um, uh, negotiations, cooperation, um, and so on. Um, and, you know, conceptually, they don't quite uh, uh, fit well uh, together. Uh, so there's a kind of bit of a mismatch in the uh, presentation at this point. Uh, but that's how it played out uh, in practice. So, uh, classically, I think most people would uh, say the NPT's origins lay with the, uh, the Irish UN General Assembly resolutions. Um, I actually focus more on the, uh, the US Soviet Union non transfer declarations uh, that came with, um, came after China got the bomb, but they were using uh, Soviet technology. Um, and like, there's a competing narrative that would be uh, interesting to, uh, to explore. Uh, was it the uh, disarmament? resolutions of the Irish, or was it kind of uh, a US-Soviet initiative uh, to bring about the NPT? Uh, we can talk about that one. Um, but in, in my mind, so what was happening was that there was negotiation between the US and the Soviet Union, and basically coming to a mutual agreement on what was non-proliferation. Um, because at this point, uh, this there was like the Gilpatrick community stuff in the, the, the 60s, so there was some um, uh, uh, coming to a common view of non-proliferation. Uh, but really, it was these conversations that um, focused on what does non-proliferation mean from a US and Soviet Union perspective. Um, and it came to a head with the issue of the multilateral nuclear force, um, where, uh, where the idea was basically that, that the US would, um, in a more direct way than would eventually happen under NATO, uh, 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 share nuclear systems. Um, there, there's a nuance to that that um, I, I won't go into uh, just now. But basically, the Soviet Union, Union was saying, well, that's a non-proliferation issue. You can't uh, include that within scope. 
So when uh, uh, MLF was eventually uh, a site, um, then it became possible for there to be a common view between the US and Soviet Union on non-proliferation. And we can talk more about, uh, about that. Um, and then, you know, so there's these non-transfer uh, agreements, which is what the text is at the bottom uh, here. So in my mind, the uh, NPT was um, uh, a non-proliferation instrument rather than a disarmament in instrument. And I kind of dug into the archives to understand where the uh, peaceful uses language came from and where the disarmament language came from uh, in the NPT. Um, and I, I actually did find the answer to this, which was that um, some of these things were in the preamble, um, but then the uh, 18 Nation Disarmament uh, Committee uh, insisted that they be moved to the operative paragraphs. Um, so one of the questions in my mind was, well, you know, what did the U.S. and you know the other key states think about these provisions? Uh, were they important or not? Um, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, there was also discussions on how to make the NPT loophole free, and there was a criteria listed for what that meant. The NPT, as negotiated, did not meet that criteria, uh, which is uh, something else we could, uh, could discuss. Um, but on this question of um, the, whether the disarmament provisions um, were meaningful, I found this great quote, and this was in the, um, the, uh, the NSC memo to Nixon, recommending uh, that he bring the NPT into effect. And effectively, he says, uh, this article is, and I'm going to mispronounce this, uh, horroratory, uh, which basically means uh, uh, an argument without, uh, without you know, force, and uh, presents no problems. Uh, so this was, an, the, you know, when the U.S. agreed to bring this treaty into force, uh, thinking that effectively they weren't bound by the disarmament provisions, uh, which is... Uh, 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 <laughs> quite different from the, the, the kind of way it's understood uh, now. So uh, what does uh, this mean for my argument? Well, you have an NPT um, that would only be binding on the countries that are brought into effect. Uh, you have the, the key powers behind it, the US and the Soviet Union who were, were doing this principally as a way of formalizing the fact that they wouldn't transfer nuclear weapons to others uh, rather than as a, a kind of a fundamental non-proliferation uh, regime. Um, and certainly not driven by, uh, you know, kind of a mutual and agreed uh, desire to move towards disarmament um, in the way that it would perhaps be uh, understood by, uh, by others. Now, let's jump back to India for a second. Uh, you know, so uh, this is where the narrative uh, follows consecutively. So yeah, you have the NPT. India says we won't do that. Um, they put a uh, nuclear device underground and detonated. Um, of course, using the reactor that they got from. Uh, Canada uh, and so on. Yeah, so we, we've got to the point, and now I wanted to talk to the response to the Indian uh, peaceful nuclear explosion, uh, because again, in my mind, this is a particularly pivotal uh, point in the evolution of non-proliferation controls. Um, and I call it strategies that failed partly because, and I don't have time to kind of talk to this in detail, but each US administration took a slightly different approach to non-proliferation. Um, and actually, they were um, they, they they often ran counter to each other, uh, so the kind of the inconsistency there was uh, problematic in a way that we can talk about, uh, but I won't spend too much time on. So following the uh, peaceful nuclear explosion, um, the U.S. led this strategy review, mostly led by the State Department and Kissinger, um, and one part of that was uh, that they would convene a meeting of uh, suppliers really in the U.S. mind, driven by the idea of requiring full-scope safeguards as a condition of supply. And full-scope safeguards means that every nuclear facility in the state would be subject to safeguards, uh, as opposed to the alternative, which is that only uh, supplied uh, facilities would be subject to safeguards. Um, and if only supplied facilities are subject to safeguards, then of course any indigenous facilities could be uh, used for weapons uh, purposes. Um, so that was really, uh, and I've got the memo in which the U.S. proposed this to other countries, and uh, that was like the, the top of their wish list. There were uh, other points, uh, uh, eight or nine other points on the list, uh, but that was the, the kind of the, the, the key U.S. desire uh, from uh, the, what would become the nuclear suppliers group. As an aside, um, so it turns out in the 60s and actually back to the 50s, there was a, a meeting uh, that was called the Suppliers Group, um, and in, in, in at least one document it was called the Nuclear Suppliers Group, 
uh, there was uh, Western countries. Um, you know, so a quirk of the history is that we've sort of forgotten about the other nuclear suppliers group. Although in my mind, they actually they do follow on uh, uh, from each other. Uh, you know, so this one's a bit different because it will involve uh, the Soviet Union and so on. Um, but actually, um, one of the things I found is that there were meetings of the nuclear suppliers groups in whatever guys in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and on. Um, even though the kind of the conventional wisdom is that the, the NSG men in the 70s stopped in the 70s. And there was actually a meeting of the nuclear suppliers group in the 80s that I found that no one knows about. So there's just like curves of history that are sort of forgotten, which is kind of a, an, an interesting aside. Um, so during these uh, meetings, um, good progress was made in kind of coming to mutual agreement on um, uh, non-proliferation export controls. Except France steadfastly refused to agree to this requirement for full scope safeguards. Um, even though it had agreed to act as though it was a member of the NPT. Um, and actually, um, I'm not sure it was widely known that France had said that it would act as though it was a member of the, the NPT. Um, it, it would eventually um, become a kind of full participant, uh, but not until uh, much later. Um, and, and we could talk about why France was kind of taking this position, uh, but it was sort of the uh, goalist politics, uh, I guess one would say. Um, so the, the NSG meetings came to a conclusion um, without an agreement for full scope safeguards. Um, I managed to talk to Joseph Nye, uh, who happened to be uh, Carter's um, uh, special rep for non-proliferation, and uh, he was the one that had got to Paris um, uh, to kind of you know, bring this to a conclusion. Um, and effectively, uh, Joseph Nye said that uh, the, the US brought the nuclear suppliers group meetings uh, to a, a close to, uh, he said, kick the issue into the long grass. And what he meant by that was that uh, they had got some concessions from France in terms of this reprocessing plant export uh, to Pakistan, but they didn't feel that they were going to go to any more concessions from, uh, from France. They didn't want the issue to go away or die entirely. So they set up another initiative, the Nuclear Fuel Cycle Evaluation Program. Sorry, my slide is complicated. Uh, so that they would buy some time, uh, whilst this is still sort of on the agenda, uh, but not a live issue, um, uh, so that they could kind of you know, keep this issue into the long grass. So that then meant that the NSG meetings in the 70s stopped, and that's significant for a reason that I'll come on to uh, in, in a second. Um, and it's unhelpful too, because uh, NC um, ultimately concluded that um, there was no technical solution to non-proliferation. So it was a bit of a, you know, an unuseful exercise, other than buying a bit of time, and we can talk about, uh, talk about that. So then we come on to Pakistan, and I put this up as kind of an example or case study of uh, why the, uh, the, the, the lack of progress in the regime was problematic. Um, and I, I won't focus too much on uh, AQ Khan, it's an interesting story about how he kind of took the designs from, uh, uh, from Eureka back to Pakistan, and so on and so on. Um, I actually have the, uh, the, the original report into the CAN network, uh, which I don't think has been published in full yet, so I'll put it onto the archives uh, uh, website. Um, so CAN was uh, important, but so too was the, the support of China. And the support of China is really interesting in this context, because if you go back to the memos that Nixon and his team had written on the nuclear suppliers group, they expressly said that they didn't have to invite China, because China was not at that time capable of nuclear supply. And then a couple of years later, China is helping Pakistan get the bomb. Um, you know, so it, it demonstrates kind of a lack of uh, understanding in a very kind of clear and consistent way. Uh, so China was excluded from the, from the NSG uh, for that purpose. But it gets even worse. So then you have the UK, uh, which gets intelligence information from a company about Pakistan seeking inverters for use in its uranium enrichment program. And then they're saying, saying, what do we do with this? Uh, classically, they should take it to a forum like the Nuclear Suppliers Group and ask other countries not to supply the technology, uh, because otherwise someone could simply step in and, and, and supply it, and there's no point. So the UK decided not to do that, specifically because they were concerned that the intelligence could be used by the Soviet Union to turn Pakistan uh, against the West in the context of the Cold War. Um, you know, so a very kind of clear um, uh, and direct 
uh, implication here that uh, the uh, the kind of cold war dynamics were uh, taking precedence over non-proliferation uh, concerns. Um, instead, and, and partly this is also because the NSG anyway wasn't being at this point because of the US decision to kick into the long grass. Uh, so the, the UK uh, starts like a bilateral outreach program where it's asking friendly governments to stop exports to Pakistan, including Julius Woods and so on. Um, and it takes, it takes years for them to make progress. It continues, um, but it's just too late. By this point, Pakistan has everything it needs. It doesn't make any, uh, 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 you know, the, the opportunity to, to um, arrest the proliferation uh, has been lost in the Pakistan case. Um, in the book, I go into much more detail about some episodes I'm going to skip over um, to try to kind of move us to a point where I can uh, uh, end the uh, presentation. Uh, let me focus on the 90s uh, a little bit. Um, you know, so there is the AQCAN network uh, and Iraq's clandestine nuclear program. Um, I, I won't kind of dwell on the details of those other than to say they're really interesting if you're um, not aware of them. And they provided nuclear technology to uh, other states. The point I wanted to focus on, though, is that the nuclear suppliers group starts to meet again. Um, actually, um, there were moves to reconvene it before uh, the kind of full details of Iraq's program were uh, uncovered. Although classically, we would say it was Iraq's program that kind of got it going again. Um, but the point is that the passage of time is sort of a relevant factor here. Um, so because of the proliferation, proliferation episodes, um, a lot of governments had actually taken steps to unilaterally adopt dual scope safeguards as a condition of supply. Uh, in the US, the uh, US uh, NP, NNPA um, um, uh, Act uh, did that. And then in Germany, they also did that. And Germany did it basically because um, they were uh, uh, kind of diplomatically embarrassed that uh, German companies kept being involved uh, in problematic uh, episodes. And France also signs the, uh, the, the NPT. I've still not actually kind of fully got to the bottom of France's decision on the NPT. Um, uh, but generally, it's kind of put forward that their kind of worldview was changing about the end of the Cold War. Perhaps people in the room have a, a view on that. But whatever the, whatever the factors, by this point, it was easier. It was possible for the, the nuclear suppliers group uh, to agree this requirement for full scope safeguards as a condition of supply. Um, actually, because most governments had already set this as unilateral requirement, what the NSG was more doing was standardizing the conditions um, amongst all the states rather than setting it as a new requirement. Um, so that side of things uh, uh, worked uh, relatively uh, easily. Um, the nuclear supplies group was larger by this point. Um, it included former Soviet Union countries um, as well as some other countries that had um, adopted the guidelines since the, the 1970s. Um, so it standardized a uh, uh, of safeguards as a condition of supply, um, and it also agreed on controls on dual-use goods. And the controls on dual-use goods is quite interesting because we now uh, practitioners would say that it's an essential element um, of non-proliferation to control dual-use goods. Actually, the nuclear suppliers group in the 70s did discuss controlling dual-use goods, um, and it was recognized that it was important, uh, but they just never got around to it because the U.S. had truncated the meetings of the nuclear suppliers group early. Um, so it's a, another example of there was a gap there, and actually Iraq kind of benefited a lot from that gap. Uh, it came about because the, the meetings of the nuclear suppliers group had, had been concluded uh, early. Um, and without kind of uh, getting too much into the AQCAN network, so you know the nuclear suppliers group did make good progress in the 90s, uh, but it just wasn't broad enough, uh, because when you look at uh, the AQCAN AQ network, uh, which had manufacturing hubs in countries like Malaysia and the UAE, um, that were part of the nuclear suppliers group, and it's clear that they, you know, the regime still had uh, had gaps. Um, so this brings us to sort of the last substantive I have slide before I sum up my argument: um, UN resolutions. Um, so following the end of the um, Cold War, the UN Security Council becomes increasingly active on non-proliferation topic. Well, why? Well, partly because uh, non-proliferation should be a, a relatively easy topic for um, the, uh, the P5 to agree on. Um, and just like from a kind of a proper realist uh, theory perspective, it's not in the interest of the P5 to see any more 
countries proliferate, with, with, with nuance, of course. Um, but that, that kind of sort of held true in an era in which there was more cooperation on the Security Council. Sadly, I think that sort of dropped off a lot, and uh, we can kind of talk about more contemporary uh, issues uh, if people want to. But in, in this period, uh, there was kind of a, a, a willingness uh, to uh, work within the UN uh, Security Council context uh, to, to further um, mutual interests, which happened also to be international security interests. Um, so then I think of resolutions like Resolution 1540, which um, uh, uh, effectively universalizes the requirements for nuclear export controls um, as a form of uh, external regulation. And I, I phrase it like that because when you look at collective action literature, um, external regulation is like one of the few approaches that one can use to overcome um, a collective action problem. Um, you know, so it's a, a specific complement to the non-proliferation regime um, uh, um, and, and it's uh, taken through a different type of mechanism which isn't kind of each country um, uh, coming to its own uh, decision on the matter uh, but kind of a, a, a smaller community deciding on behalf of, 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 of everyone. Um, but unfortunately, uh, implementation um, uh, still kind of uh, varies considerably in terms of uh, effectiveness and so on. Um, plus, the politicization of the Security Council today uh, is, 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 is problematic. Uh, so, so that's um, that's the kind of the, the history I wanted to talk through. Uh, let me just kind of share a few thoughts on if one thinks about the non-proliferation framework today, informed by exploring it as a collective action uh, a problem. And then after this, I'll kind of present some uh, key takeaways. Um, so. There was an effort in the 40s to come up with an overarching system of control. We never got there. Instead, what we had was a, a non-proliferation that was um, uh, developed iteratively, almost on a house of sand. And by that, what I mean is that more actors were coming into the picture, more vested interests were coming along, more countries were uh, gaining interest in these technologies, and technologies themselves were changing. And so because we didn't start off with an overarching system of control, we ended up sort of chasing our own tail, um, iteratively developing a, a solution that can never quite catch up with the overarching needs um, of a, a non-proliferation uh, system. I do, however, think that that regime, combined with UN resolutions such as 1540, provide a sort of a holistic framework that mostly de delineates countries with proliferation interests from those without. So I sort of think that we're getting there in terms of having a framework. Um, you know, we're sort of 60 years <laughs> too late with that. But we're getting there um, now, at least with regards to nuclear, and if I was to kind of turn this around for missile and so on, it'd be a bit of a different story, uh, actually. Um, and many of the gaps um, and problems that we have today, and indeed the gaps and the problems that we've had at each part of the, um, the, uh, the history here, were foreseeable results of the limitations of the regime. And I take the, uh, the Atmos for Peace example where um, you know, there was a clear decision by Eisenhower to move forward with the initiative even though, even though there was concern from the technical folks. Uh, so the problems have been foreseeable. Um, the, 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 the problem has been uh, not being able to uh, get all of the actors on the same page about what to do with them. Uh, and then my last one is that there's lessons that we can take to apply to the future. Uh, so a couple of uh, takeaway slides. Um, first one, cooperation on non-proliferation proliferation and export controls is in the interest of all states. Um, there's nuance to that, but the kind of the fundamental holds true. Um, and you know, I'd argue it holds true with regards to nuclear, probably uh, holds true with regards to missile. Uh, but the, the fundamental is that we should be able to find ways to cooperate on these topics because it's not in the security interest of states to see these weapons proliferate. But then you have a whole range of factors which kind of impede progress, impede uh, the coordination of adoption of controls. That includes mistrust, um, a lack of transparency around uh, implementation, uh, vested interests, um, and other factors which hinder cooperation of control, even though there's a mutual interest in doing so. Uh, so then the question is, how do you overcome that? Um, and then you can sort of come up with a list of enablers that would help build mutual trust and transparency around how these controls are being implemented. 
um, and you know, in the book I kind of go into uh, uh, go into this um, and things like kind of setting up clear rules and so on are part of that. Um, the next point is that states have usually been willing to forego specific exports when there's a clear indication it will be used in a way of concern. Um, a lot of the, the, the challenges actually comes back to sort of a definitional one or a scoping one where, um, you know, if it was clear that it would be used in a way of concern, it wouldn't go ahead. Um, but there's a bit of ambiguity about, um, you know, how this specific transaction will help a program of concern. Um, but when, when there's kind of a, a clear um, negative consequence from moving forward with it, um, in, in almost all the cases I've looked at, states have taken the decision not to uh, proceed with the transaction. Um, but at the same time, suspicion that other states are not living up to their commitments has plagued the development of controls. Um, and actually, if I was to kind of go through the book, I could simply like be highlighting each example of where, you know, one country has said, well, we're not going to do that because country X is not doing that or, or whatever it is. Um, and that's this point about sort of transparency um, um, and so on around um, if states can have confidence that other states will uh, uh, are acting in a certain way, then they can kind of uh, be more relaxed about acting in the same uh, same way. Um, I'll skip over the point on international enforcement for a second. Um, next point: um, limited cooperation between smaller groups proves easier to achieve uh, because, well, you know, there's just fewer um, impediments. There's fewer uh, reasons for mistrust. Uh, um, more openness because it's friendly countries, um, and so on. Um, but uh, cooperation among smaller groups of states doesn't um, solve the overarching issue, which is that there will be other countries um, outside of the small group who are capable of uh, a nuclear supply. Uh, so that's sort of a caution against focusing too much on like-minded countries, which is um, one of the things that actually I have to say we're guilty of in the non-proliferation regime uh, today. Um, the involvement of Security Council, um, uh, in my mind, is kind of a, a really useful step here. So we do need to think about how we can kind of get cooperation and Security Council on these issues um, again going forward. Um, and, and actually, it's not been the focus of, of, of my talk today, but um, uh, I'm pretty depressed about uh, uh, where the Security Council stands on uh, these types of topics uh, at present. Um, but ultimately, and this is like my last big point, um, you know, the kind of the, the, the ad hoc and responsive regime that we've got um, sort of might work with regards to nuclear proliferation. It's not going to be perfect. Um, but actually, if we really do want to kind of get serious about this and about this with and non-proliferation, we sort of have to think bigger. Um, I'm not sure if we can just base it on the type of regime we have. I would sort of go back to the type of thing we discussed in the 1940s for international control of atomic energy agency, atomic energy. Um, as the sort of basis that we might need to look at for a, you know, a, a kind of a proper and enduring solution here. Uh, final point, um, I've collected a lot of archive materials uh, for this project. Um, like, I, I, I'm actually not aware of, kind of um, a, a sort of a more complete set of materials, although there are kind of good collections out there. So because of that, I want to share all of these materials We've set up this non-proliferation archive uh, website, and effectively I'm going to release the materials in batches associated with a little post describing them. Um, so you know, look forward to that, and I'll share a link uh, on that in due course. That's the uh, end of the presentation, um, and uh, you know, I sort of encourage you to, to read the book. Thank you so much. So, uh, I personally have lots of questions I'd like to ask Ian, but instead I'm just going to go two anecdotes which may or may not be in your, your archive, and then uh, we'll let you field the, the questions. The, the first anecdote uh, involves uh, a very distinguished uh, foreign service officer and international uh, civil servant by the name of David Fisher, who in 1974, at the time of the Indian uh, peaceful nuclear explosion, uh, a euphemistic term for its uh, nuclear weapons detonation, um, was the head of external affairs at the IAEA. Uh, and David recounts, he, David spent uh, a number of years as a uh, senior uh, uh, visiting fellow here in Monterey, and he recounted how 
the director general at the time, a man by the name of Eklund, who incidentally had headed the Swedish nuclear weapons program before he took his position uh, at the IAEA, uh, when he received word of the Indian nuclear explosion, his inclination was to send a congratulatory <laughs> note. And David uh, reminded him that perhaps in his prior capacity, it said that the Swedish nuclear weapons program would be appropriate, but it probably was not befitting the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency. But that gives you a, a sense perhaps of the mindset uh, of the IAEA and uh, the manner in which they uh, kind of address peaceful nuclear use. Uh, the other anecdote uh, involves Tadeusz Skrulak, who was the Polish ambassador uh, who uh, headed the NSG in 1992. Uh, it so happened that we were holding one of our first large meetings of our NIS nonproliferation uh, uh, group meeting in Monterey uh, in April, and Strulak was supposed to be one of the featured speakers. And he had a terrible time because he was supposed to be chairing this meeting, uh, dealing with this major uh, kind of reconfiguration of the, the, the guidelines of the NSG. Uh, and so I don't know if we can sit to each of this since the pocket or not. But he kind of told said that you know he was in a great hurry to work to wrap up that meeting so they could get on a plane and make it to <laughs> the in time for the uh, the session. So indirectly we were involved also in the uh, the uh, the NSG meeting uh, in 1992, which was important as Ian mentioned with respect to uh, the focus on dual use uh, exports. So um, let's simply. Uh, some, some comments that may or may not find your way into your archive. Uh, but I'd be pleased uh, to hear from those of you in the room and also those of you who are uh, on our call here. Do, and can you see anything in the chat? I guess I would say if you, if you are uh, connected virtually, if you could send a note via chat, uh, I think that would be good. Uh, because I know, you know Sarah in particular has done a lot of work on the nuclear suppliers group uh, in the book that we brought out in 2018. And I want to give her an opportunity if she wants to wing it. But uh, Robert Shaw first, and then Jeffrey Knopf, and then we'll continue around the room. Uh, Ian, first, congratulations on the uh, book. This is a nice contribution you know, to, to the space. And uh, just, uh, you know, I can appreciate you know, what, uh, what was involved in bringing this together, both the archival research as well as you know, bringing forth the arguments is quite timely as well. Um, my, my, I have a question, actually, and it, it relates to um, the uh, supply of the Cirrus reactor uh, from, from Canada. And I thought it was, it was, it was interesting, is that that, was, that seemed to be kind of an early point where um, the lack of a control mechanism was, was rather readily exploited. Now, I'm, I'm not sure if exploited is, is the right term, but Canada moved quickly on this, and it, it certainly had, had ramifications later. And I, and I was just curious what, what your thinking was with regards to you know, Canada's motivations here. What, 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 was, what was kind of driving the, the speed of action? Was it, um, you know, was it economic interest? Was it sort of reputational interest? Um, because it does seem to be an early indication of the collective action problem that, uh, that your work is, is illustrating. Uh, thanks uh, for that. Um, I, I, I was fortunate to be able to spend a lot of time in the Canadian, Canadian archives, actually, um, and I was I was interested in this question too. Um, and you know, the best answer I have is actually there wasn't an economic interest um, uh, question. And in fact, in Canada is interesting because you also have the uh, Atomic Energy Corporation of Canada uh, Limited, a um, commercial entity that's involved in the, the, the nuclear uh, sphere. Um, and actually, throughout this, um, they were kind of sending pretty clear messages that they weren't particularly interested in, and not just this, but also the follow-on um, uh, deals uh, from kind of a, a company uh, perspective. And actually, just a little anecdote on that. So after the Sirius Raptor, um, they, uh, they, they then moved on to uh, uh, export a more advanced uh, uh, Kandu-type uh, reactor uh, uh, to India. Um, which India went ahead and built a kind of a, a duplicate of um, and kind of marked it under their own um, go under their own auspices. And so the question there was, I was interested in was um, did uh, did you know was that in violation of an agreement with Canada to kind of build that um, a duplicate reactor? And it turns out it wasn't. I found 
archive documents that says, that from the time that says, you know, one of the, the challenges with this agreement is that uh, uh, India could go ahead and build a, a clone of this thing. Um, you know, so it comes back to the question of um, uh, why. Um, for the for the Cirrus reactor, the, the best answer I have is um, the, the person that's kind of um, given credit for coming up with this scheme was the per person that was responsible for the uh, Colombo plan for, um, yeah, so it's like a former British colony type uh, uh, relationship with different uh, uh, countries. Um, so um, it's the person that was in charge of that that's kind of attributed with pushing this initiative um, and kind of getting support behind it. Um, and uh, you know, it makes it a bit difficult to kind of categorize. That's not an economic interest um, as such. It's sort of a, sort of, I guess you'd say, like a post-colonial uh, uh, type interest, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so, so that's the, the, that's the answer I have on, on, on that one, which is kind of interesting. Um, but um, you know, Canada did um, uh, push against uh, um, coordination of safeguards, and um, I mentioned the meeting in which the uh, the U.S., U.K., and Canada came together to agree their positions before the statute negoti negotiations at the IAEA, and um, and I think this would shock uh, my um, Canadian diplomatic friends today. But in that meeting, uh, and I have the minutes of it. Um, Canada says, amongst other things, that um, they didn't agree with the U.S. and U.K. on, you know, the, the, the approach that was being proposed for uh, non-proliferation at the agency, um, and that they would reserve their um, options to give to assist new, other countries with nuclear weapons if they <laughs> if they wanted to, uh, which is really kind of interesting. But it comes in the context of the supply to Canada and them not wanting to kind of close down their uh, down their options. But there's there's kind of a, a really interesting. The Canada stuff is a really interesting subset of this, for sure. Thanks, Robert. Uh, yeah. Yeah, then, um, my thanks also, Ian. Uh, even though I'm uh, trained as a political scientist, I've always enjoyed history and archival research, so I really um, enjoyed a little uh, memo uh, archival tidbits that you threw in. Um, I don't have any disagreements with, with the broad outline you sketched. Um, uh, the, the regime is flawed. There are collective action problems. I think you pick out correctly a lot of the key turning points historically. Um, but but I would um, propose adding to the explanation you gave. Uh, it's not here in the book, but the talk has to be shorter than the book. Um, but at least from your presentation, I think that you um, underestimated the impact of Cold War politics. Mm -hmm. um, and I, this was a very long time ago now, but, but I did some pretty serious research on Adams for Peace. Uh, back in the day, um, and um, uh, there may be a lot more archival material available now than I have, but, but as I remember it, um, the, the Eisenhower administration and the president's interest in Adams for Peace um, had several motivations which were very intimately Cold War related. So, so one thing is that this happened right in the uh, period after Stalin had died, and so Eisenhower, uh, on a more positive note, was interested in would the post-Stalin leadership in the Soviet Union be less um, intrinsically hostile and create an opening for maybe uh, improving relations mm -hmm. in the Cold War. And so he was looking for some kind of olive branch you know, to extend. Um, but in the larger context of the administration, where a lot of his advisors were sort of more hawkish than he was, um, this all ended up being framed in a way that was more uh, competitive. So there were some worries about uh, essentially the propaganda battle for the sympathy of, of world opinion. Uh, and uh, Dulles, the Secretary of State, was very attuned to this. Um, would there be a Soviet, you know, quote unquote, peace offensive that would, um, you know, rally the decolonizing world to the Soviet side of what the United States do to counter what they expected would be? Soviet propaganda, so Adams for Peace was part of this as a propaganda sure, yeah. gesture. Um, but then the other part of it, which was a sort of crazy miscalculation, was that at the time they didn't have uh, anything uh, approaching accurate knowledge about the size of uh, uranium deposits around the world. And so it was thought that by creating a, um, a fuel bank system in which the United States and the Soviet Union would both contribute uh, uranium for use in the developing world, that the Soviet uh, contributions would use up yeah. uh, a, a significant portion of their available uranium, which would has not be available mm -hmm. to the Soviet nuclear weapons program. So it was a backdoor way to try to trick the Soviets into a kind of arms control regime. So there was 
Um, so there's many reasons why they never thought about the proliferation aspects of this, because that wasn't what was on their mind. This was sure. all about the relationship with you know, the Soviet Union. Yeah, yeah and, 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 and actually, like, I, I do cover those points in the, in the book, and I kind of um, came to kind of the same, I guess, the same kind of archival materials and uh, conclusions from that. Um, and in and, and each chapter, I, like, you know, it's an academic book, so in each chapter, I do kind of have a framework that I test and wanted things is tested in each is the effect of Cold War politics and so on. So like it, it's very systematically uh, explored in the book. But I guess what I'd say is, you know, the that was an important factor at certain times. It was important in the, the kind of forties, uh, the, the fifties, um, um, and then you know you have the Gilpatrick uh, uh, commission, which is sort of interesting because in that they effectively ask the question of isn't a, a mutual interest of us in the Soviet Union to cooperate on, on non-proliferation? Um, and that's sort of the first, I would describe it as like the first expression of a US like non-proliferation strategy, uh, actually, almost. Um, and then afterwards, there's like a, um, there, there's, you know, then there's still mutual mistrust or mistrust in the US um, about you know, whether it would be in, um, you know, whether they could work with the Soviet Union on this. Um, and, and one of the other factors in my framework is the, the importance of face-to-face -face communications in different periods. And there's, um, there's a meeting um, um, between the US and the Soviet Union, and I think the UK was part of it too, and, uh, and I need to kind of remind myself, um, where they actually sat down to talk about um, whether there was kind of agreement. And the US walked away from that with a view that, you know, yes, this does seem to be of a, you know, they, they kind of met with tech, technical counterparts. And they kind of walked away with that with the sense that there was um, a kind of a, a mutual technical willingness to work together on non-proliferation safeguards and so on and so on. Um, so after that, it kind of became a bit, um, you know, so then there was a kind of common agreement about what non-proliferation meant, except for the kind of multilateral nuclear force uh, point. Uh, so I, I did work through that and, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I look forward to kind of uh, hearing your thoughts after you. No, I agree with you that the 60s was a very different Mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, sure, please. Yeah. And I also see Sarah. So Sarah, Sarah I'm just going to point to uh, Sarah. Actually. Yeah. Sure, sure, please. This Hi. Is a question. So, what is the subject group of that group, like collective action problem of your investigation? What is the you define your group? Uh, what is that collective action problem? Um, well, I mean, it's, it's worth me saying. So, like, I haven't found any other non proliferation literature um, that looks at it through. Um, kind of a collective action lens. Although in one of your books, uh, the edited volume, someone does use the phrase, uh, it might even be you, about uh, non proliferation being a collective action uh, issue. So, collective action problems, um, there is a body of literature on them uh, that sort of comes more from the domestic environmental scene than the, you know, the kind of the international diplomacy scene. Uh, so, with the framework, I actually, for the book, I actually uh, uh, sort of steal from um, uh, 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 a different. Um, uh, discipline, which is always a little bit risky to do, um, and and uh, in the book I actually do define non-proliferation collective action problems, and I'm, I'm going to uh, misarticulate if I try to kind of uh, uh, remember what's uh, the way I, I formally define it. Uh, but effectively, the definition is um, when something is in a mutual shared interest, um, but um, short-term or unilateral um, interests. Um, outweigh that, or other factors intervene to prevent the common shared interest. Um, so it's the idea that if you if you all work together, you can get you get more utility. Um, but like individual states and uh, so on, if they're not cooperating, cooperating can kind of get more, uh, especially short term benefit. So my question was uh, not about the action problem, but more about the subject group of your investigation. Who are the, who are the actors that are not collectively acting? Oh, I see. Like um, if I were not. NS group members or yeah so in the um, well, uh, thanks uh, for that so in, in the book um, um, I, I actually address this in quite a structured way so I kind of talk about different groups of actors state actors non-state actors um, and then that also brings in a way of talking about companies uh, as well as kind of you know uh, uh, list actors um, and um, so, so I, I think there's multiple levels uh, to that one and for each chapter I try to, try to kind of um, uh, consider the role uh, in each one. I'm not sure I'm answering that very well, but uh, uh, maybe we can talk about that on a flight floor. Uh, Sarah, please. You can hear me still. We can hear you. Yeah. 
Okay. You can? We can. Go ahead. Okay, perfect. Um, my question is sort of related to perhaps an observation that you might have um, reached in researching your book. And, and I'm curious to know whether you found that different types of instrument are better suited to collective action. So for example, did you find that negotiated treaties are better for that? Informal agreements between, for example, nuclear suppliers? Um, are you able to kind of give any broad sense for whether you think some of these are, are better suited to collective action in the long term than others? I'm just curious if you noticed any distinctions there. Thanks. Um, thanks, uh, Sarah. So I guess um, uh, I think I'd phrase it more as overcoming collective action problems rather than um, uh, uh, the, the kind of desired end goal of being collective action. Um, and that's just because that's kind of framed it in the, uh, in, in the book. Um, but, you know, the, the research on, on collective action in the domestic sphere, and also I think this plays out in, the, in, 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 in applying it to this sphere, um, is that there's only a few different ways you can overcome collective action problems. Um, one is through um, kind of a, um, a, a kind of formalized um, a rules based system that covers all actors. Um, and that's where I sort of come back to the UN Security Council as being an example of setting up that framework. Um, another is, uh, you know, you can sort of iteratively develop a, an ad hoc system of uh, control. But actually, in, 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 in most, um, and there's statistical system drawing on something that's uh, done in the kind of environmental come domestic sphere, there's um, a lot of statistical information on what works for collective action and what doesn't. Um, but actually, um, any system that's lacking um, a, kind of an overarching effective system of control most of the time, and by most of the time, I mean like 90 plus, plus percent of the time, uh, you don't get an effective system of control that develops in a reactive way. Uh, so I would kind of draw from that that um, actually in the non-proliferation sphere, we're, uh, we're sort of up against it to come up with a system that um, you know, can iteratively improve to a point that it's, uh, um, uh, that it's effective. Um, you know, so that would be my, my kind of uh, starting point for that. Um, but then I'd say that um, you know, having formalized rules is, um, is, is, is sort of going to be a really important foundation. Um, but, you know, it's unlikely you're going to get kind of uh, reactive formalized rules that are fully encompassing. So we are always going to be chasing our tails a little bit, I think, when it comes to um, uh, you know, countering proliferation, which is a bit of a depressing thought to end with, I guess. But, oh, there we go. Thank you, Sarah. Any others? Robert, yes, yeah. just uh, related to the um, U.S. truncating you know, of the U.S. Uh, I mean, the nuclear suppliers group meetings, you know, and, and it, you know, that that in effect sort of, uh, you know, took the potential for dual use controls off the table. And then, uh, I was just curious, you know, based on based on your research, as to to what extent, I mean, was was there was was dual use being considered as as a Real agenda item, something that where there was there was genuine interest, or was it, um, you know, was was it, I, I don't know, more of a just seen as, as as kind of a, a side issue or something of, of, of lower priority. I I'm, I am curious about that because it seems like it was a missed opportunity. Yeah, it's, um, I, I need to get around to finishing a paper on uh, the history of the NSG because like having looked at the archive materials it is a bit different from what uh, what we understand it to be. So for example, what was also being discussed in the 70s, and this shocks people when I tell them, but there was discussion, and it shocks people because this is a, a, like a, a live contemporary issue. But in the 70s, there was discussion of including India and Pakistan as members of the nuclear suppliers group, um, which like has been one of the most difficult uh, um, uh, 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 issues in the last few years uh, uh, from kind of the non-proliferation export control uh, side of things. So there was a lot that was discussed there. And the UK, um, at least, because the UK was acting as chair of the Nuclear Suppliers Group, had, I think it's fair to say, pretty big aspirations for what the Nuclear Suppliers Group could do. Uh, they had aspirations for um, ongoing working groups, uh, for example, uh, that would kind of, you know, look at specific issues and, uh, and so on. Um, and then there is like, there is a specific file on, they were calling them grey areas rather than Julius items. Uh, but there's a specific file um, that the UK was maintaining of these types of things. 
um, the, 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 the 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 had to look at, um, you know. So so what, all of that was kind of cut off by the U.S. Uh, decision not to continue. And just to jump forward with the history a little bit further, um, in the um, in the eighties, you know. So I, I mentioned the kind of Pakistan seeking Julius Goods uh, thing, um, you know. So. The, the UK then did this kind of bilateral outreach thing where it was trying to get other countries to agree controls of Julius Goods. Um, there was then concern in the early 80s uh, that uh, Pakistan was, and I forget exactly what, was about to conduct a nuclear test or something. There was a rumor floating around, and that led uh, um, the UK and the US to hold an ad hoc nuclear suppliers group meeting in like, I think it was 81 or 82, I need to look back at the dates, um, with the idea of um, seeing if they could kind of get agreement that the nuclear suppliers group would meet to address the Julius Goods um, issue. So that meeting happened. Um, it happened in Vienna. It was very short. Um, but then the outcome of it was um, that there was a decision to bump it across to the designer committee um, rather than the nuclear suppliers group. And they did that. Um, and the designer committee had a problem which was it was supposed to be on the trigger list items rather than Julius Goods. So they had a clever lawyer come up with the way of saying that uh, Julius Goods for enrichment were specially designed for, um, and therefore, like it, it doesn't, like it doesn't stack up. But <laughs> but there was a reason they were doing this, which was um, the country they were uh, sort of um, worried about at that specific moment was Switzerland supplying stuff to Pakistan, um, and they they thought that um, since Claude Zanger was uh, uh, from there, that they could kind of use this as a way of <laughs> pressuring uh, him into uh, truncating the, 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 the cooperation. Uh, so, so actually there was controls on Julius Goods agreed in the 80s, and they ended up being bumped across to the Zanger Committee for, for that reason, which is interesting, actually, and it's not something I've known before, uh, before this. Burns. So, it's a kind of unpleasant topic, but I think it's You have to speak it. up for yeah. it, because we have people who sure. can't hear you. Right? I, I can also repeat the point. I'll speak up, I'll speak up. So, you mentioned about China's uh, uh, support for Pakistan. So, I've been kind of wondering uh, on different things, what xenophobia kind of as a, as a factor plays into underestimations compared to just not having good intel on, on what capabilities are. So when you think about North Korea, you know, I've been thinking about the under, un, underestimation of some of the technologies, where this does, I think, play into it. Yeah, yeah. so, as, so um, I'll just repeat that. So, um, you know, uh, to what extent is there kind of evidence of xenophobia and the kind of the underestimation of the China case? The China case isn't one that I can actually speak too well of. Um, um, I mean, there's a lot going on uh, uh, with the China one in that case. Well, let me talk about the Pakistan side of it, and, and actually there is, you know, there is clear examples of this, um, and um, I, I, I won't try to kind of quote this specific document that I'm thinking of, uh, but it does relate to uh, the UK company that was supplying the inverters to Pakistan, uh, where you know they effectively said, um, you know, uh, Pakistan is going to pay much more than uh, the, the, their worth for these things, and then there's a, a, a phrase like, well, if these idiots in Pakistan want to waste their money on this, then they can go ahead. And I was speaking exactly to that, if you, if you see what I mean. Um, uh, but I guess, on the other hand, the, you know, the, the UK company um, recognized that um, uh, there was a kind of proliferation element to it. But I think there's sort of a subtone uh, to that, for sure. And I at least come across in uh, that, uh, it's not quite a quote, because I can't uh, paraphrase it correctly. correctly. Um, um, you know, but there, there is definitely uh, uh, evidence of, uh, of, of of, of, of that. Um, I'm not so, I would need to think about it more in the context of India, um, actually. Um, I, I can't, um, no specific quotes are kind of coming to mind that would kind of uh, support that in the India case. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I what, what could suppose that it would be relevant, uh, and maybe that's why they kind of the Canadian reactor went for it. I, I can't think of examples to support that at present. Bill, please. Yeah, I think. Uh couple of observations here. Uh, I think we have to be very careful uh, as we kind of analyze uh, the impact of the NSG and 
the manner in which the international community acted with respect to, to uh, supply issues uh, through today's lens, because the situation was very different. The NPT was in a different state of development. There were different kind of norms that were subscribed to. Uh, and uh, it's hard sometimes today uh, to understand what the world looked like in the past, which is why the archival work is, is so important. And one of the problems, uh, as I see it, uh, is that uh, regardless of the countries in question, there was a tendency, uh, and more than a tendency, there was in fact uh, uh, an approach that characterized the behavior of national governments typically you know, to focus on the states as entities rather than looking at firms uh, and individuals. And so a great deal of information which was actually available uh, in the trade publications was ignored by the governments because the trade publications were not classified uh, and they simply tended not to follow this. And so it, would, it was impossible basically for the State Department uh, in the uh, uh, mid as late as the mid-1980s be able to answer as fundamental a question as how many times the country X served as a transshipper of materials uh, that were supposed to be controlled uh, to another party because they were only interested in the end user. That's the way they, they were organized. And that's really how the center uh, developed because of our attempt to use open source information to track trade by not just countries but by firms uh, and, by, uh, and by individuals. But the, the other issue I think that it, I mean, again, this is perhaps self-serving, but, you know, what I am repeatedly reminded of from my own research is the degree to which the United States and the Soviet Union found common ground on many nuclear export issues. Uh, and I'll just tell one story and then, uh, you know, try to bore you with, with more on that, on that theme. Uh, I had the opportunity uh, in the mid-1980s to travel uh, to India, uh, actually the early 1980s, uh, to explore Soviet nuclear systems to the Indian nuclear program. And I was, I expected uh, basically to have to struggle to get any material at all on, on this topic. And so I was really surprised when very, very senior folks wanted to talk to me, wanted to talk to American about how upset they were with their ally, the Soviet Union, uh, which introduced all different kinds of safeguards measures which had not yet been adopted by the United States. The whole concept of kind of pursuit was something that the Soviet put in place. The Indians were furious that they couldn't get the heavy water that they wanted you know, from, from the Soviet Union. And so uh, this is something you won't glean if you're kind of looking at it in terms of the Cold War mentality, and the old general state of U.S.-Soviet relations. But in the more narrow sphere of nuclear supply, that was another issue. I mean, another good example, when you, you talk about how we kind of categorize countries, there was uh, concern on the part of the United States about what Libya might do with respect to the development of their nuclear program. The United States wasn't anxious to kind of publicize this, <clears throat> but there were competing bids uh, made by uh, a company in Belgium uh, and the Soviet Union to provide nuclear systems. And the United States basically uh, <coughs> marshaled its allies in Europe and said, we'd much prefer the Soviet Union to be the supplier than the Belgians. We actually regard the Soviets as much more prudent when it comes to nuclear export controls. So again, this is something you might not glean from the, from the times, but uh, that in fact is the, kind of the state of play. So again, this, this kind of archival research, which kind of digs much more deeply than uh, uh, is typical, I think is absolutely crucial to understand the dynamics of decisions. And the, certainly the uh, US-Soviet uh, cooperation kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, really comes across in, in, in many cases. And then on the point about um, uh, also taking into account sub-state actors, um, so I, I mentioned the, this desire for the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty to be loophole-free, um, and there is a definition that went along with that, uh, an actual document that was published. Um, and one country, um, and I can't actually remember if it was the UAE or the UAR at the time, but whatever, um, made this point of like it has to um, uh, also uh, 
account for for uh, kind of sub-state actors uh, or, or else uh, you know, it wouldn't be effective. So again, that was something that was uh, uh, foreseen by actually like, uh, the kind of the coverage wasn't quite as good as it. Yeah. Okay. Is there any part in your book addressing NS labor to India, whether how was it interpreted as a kind of problem or like something that not communists have to do because it doesn't really fail? Yeah. So um, uh, the huge uh, point was uh, the NSG labor to India, which is a kind of controversial topic in the non-proliferation uh, sphere. Why, and I do cover it in the book, um, sort of because it has to be com covered for completeness. Um, you know, but I, I try to kind of be objective in the book and kind of not uh, uh, kind of express a view uh, uh, on its kind of merits per se. Other than to say that, you know, so we've got this non-proliferation. Uh, the NPT covers most countries, and we've kind of got a, a, a kind of a non-proliferation regime now that's pretty global. As I think about it, you know, one of the Conceptual things I have to think about now is um, how do we uh, how do we cover the countries that are outside of the, the, the kind of regime proper, and, and actually I, I do think that we're kind of at a point where we have to figure out um, how we kind of um, engage or work with the countries that are on the periphery, uh, and there's kind of a pretty well grounded group uh, now, uh, so I sort of think about it in that way, uh, but I don't really you know I, I can't really come to a conclusion uh, 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 on it. Um, you know, for, for better or for worse, it is what it is, <laughs> sort of thing. So, but yeah, I, I do cover that. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me, uh, at this point, not seeing you know, other uh, questions, I um, want to express my appreciation uh, to Ian for his illuminating uh, talk. Uh, we all look forward to getting autographed copies of your <laughs> book as soon as it's uh, ready for distribution. I think one thing that will be of particular interest uh, uh, to our students going forward is the opportunity to kind of work with you uh, to tap this unusual research that you're developing for archival work so that many of the questions that we've been talk about, uh, we've been talking about can be explored by you in your, in your own classroom uh, research and work at the center. So please join me in thanking our distinguished speaker.